This should work, I think, unless I'm... Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, you know what? Screw it, because... Because, you know, whatever. We don't care. Using the table. Fuck it. I would have liked for that to work. I'm not quite sure why it doesn't. And that's an impetus on me to do better error messages when I do polymorphism. Okay. So, you know, every time we add one of these to this table, um, we've got all these things. So now, I don't want to add warrior again. If I do, the hash table should take things with multiple keys and... Oh no, will it overwrite? I don't remember the behavior of this hash table. Well, we do not... Okay, at least we know that warrior is in the table. So that's good. Like, that's good. Um, let's go back here. Delete these. Save. Added warrior to names table. Dumping table with nothing in it? Why is the names... What? What? It's like, am I resetting that table for some, what? Am I resetting the wrong thing? This is where I need a data breakpoint and a bugger to say where the hell is table resetting. Um, didn't you set count to zero when you're setting something? You mem set the occupancy. Mem That's a different hash table that I mem set. Oh, wait. Okay, so here's the thing. Catalog itself has a table that maps from string to value type. And this value type is the asset, the animation names. That is a different table from this table, which maps from name to name, right? So in principle, Oh God, I'm resetting the wrong table. Oh, this is funny. So I should have said reset names. This is what happens when you have too many things called table. I should have reset names the table because that's the table in the animation's name. But when I debugged it, the table was reset. But the reason it was reset was because we were making a whole new names. So it had an empty table. So it looked like this was doing the right thing, but it was really doing the wrong thing. It was really resetting the wrong table. And that is the power of generics, everybody. You could shoot yourself in the foot even more than you thought. All right, so I'm walking, I'm walking. I bet it's just gonna work now. We've debugged enough things that this should just work. That's my theory. Okay, warrior, boom. Boom. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Okay, let's change it uh, to Yeah. I'm playing
playing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and crawling across the. And then I can change it back. See, isn't that great? Isn't that great? It's almost like a game engine. It's almost like a game engine. Now let me take out all these prints. Prints and the revolution. I'm still not in the habit of like going into the debugger mainly because it doesn't totally work consistently enough that I want to, but we're getting there. Um, where did I put all this stuff? Yeah. Wait, did I? Yeah. Let's see how many other print statements I spammed. None. Let's make sure it still works. If I do this, I think it'll take the second one. Oh no, we've got two entries in the hash table now. I should maybe detect that as an error, but we'll do that later. Do that later. This frickin' thing, all of that. But isn't that great that I can just say, if this generic happens to be this one type, do all this junk? That's great. I don't know why I couldn't call dump table. That's that's to be investigated. I may I maybe know why. No, I don't know why. I don't know why. That didn't work. It's probably something dumb that I'm not thinking of. Dump table, where did I put dump table? Here's catalog. So we'll just keep that around. We're not gonna keep compiling it, but we'll keep it around. That's great. Make sure the wizard still works. Yep, everything works. This is a little more than I had pessimistically hoped to do tonight, and that's good because I'm a little tired. So let's do Q and A on anything that happened tonight, or we'll do a little. We'll entertain a little bit of off topic, not too far off topic. Programming questions only, please. But they could be about any kind of programming. Let me turn on my fireplace. Where did I get the animations from? An animator is making the animations. From the outside, it seems to me that there are dangerous levels of nested usings and name collision. Well, maybe. Um, so the thing is, I have this same problem in C++ often, not even with usings, just with, well, with inheritance, which is the same thing, right? So like, a classic problem I have in C++ is like a, a base class has something called flags and then a derived class also has flags but different flags and like I use the wrong flags field or something, right? Um, which I suppose that one can be gotten around with type checking in some cases. For this, I feel like 
maybe my habit should be that I name things more specifically, right? So like table is a very generic name. Maybe I shouldn't be calling so many things table. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, definitely what I want to do as I keep programming is, like, see if this kind of problem happens more. And if it does, then maybe we issue warnings in case, like, maybe... I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to think of a case that wouldn't introduce a lot of false positives. Um, I don't know. We, we just have to see uh, if it's a problem, if it is exactly what the problem is, and then what a good solution might be. Can we see what happens when all three walking lines are commented out? Well, I believe that you'll just get the T pose, right? Because it's an un unknown animation. Uh, well, it's actually, but what happens is we try to play the animation and it doesn't, it's not found, so we stay in idle. We would be in the T-pose if we weren't already playing an animation. Um, when this full system is done, of course, we'll like log error messages and stuff when this happens. But right now, it's it's a little bit wasted work to do that because things aren't in the structure that they will finally be. Am I focused more on the game or the compiler? Uh, I go back and forth between which one I'm working on at any given time. Do I have ideas about how that debugging could have gone smoother? That was a pretty smooth debugging because there were like several problems and I went through them all in a relatively small amount of time. Um, I don't, I don't know if you've ever debugged software, but that was, that was pretty good. I mean, I assume you have, because you're at, it's a question that a programmer would ask. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you had like a very good debugger program, visualize, visualize, visualizer, lots of things go faster. If you're not tired because you're programming at midnight after working all day, lots of things go faster. So uh, I don't know, but I didn't feel like that was a particularly slow debugging. Um, I feel like that was okay. Of course, we would always like anything go to go faster if we can. Yes, Gary Johansson is talking about macros and generics, and I think you'll like one of the upcoming demos. Not the next one, but later. Will the game have music? The game already has music, I just have it turned off. The wizard does not cast a shadow? Yes, he does. It's just under him. It's because of the camera angle. Look, look closely, and you see the wizard shadow. Look, look, he casts shadow. Do I have an opinion on IntelliSense type editor functionality? Yes, I've talked about it many times in these streams. I'm not going to do it again. Sorry. If there was a fact, that would be in the fact. With the null value before, I was just wondering if all variables in the scope of a function basically get treated as if they were all declared at the top, meaning if they have any constructors, initialization, it'll always happen. If the slow function means you return early. Okay, I see. So what happens right now is... Um, the stack space for all the local variables gets allocated at once because you don't want to keep spending instructions allocating stack if you go into subscopes or something, right? So the stack space gets allocated at once, but you don't execute the initialization code until you hit that line of code. So it's uninitialized until you get to it. And uh, my impression is that that's how most compiled languages do it. Like, I don't think that's a radical approach. Like when I step through C++ in the debugger, for example, it looks like that same thing is happening. Why didn't I use a diff to find the print statements? Um, did I need to? It looked like what I did was faster than the diff.
like a multi-file diff across a whole project, including all the legit changes, doesn't seem like it would be very fat. Is it okay to try to switch 75 hertz monitor to 60 hertz mode in case you want your game loop to run at 60 hertz? You could try it. <laughs> I don't know. Would hot loading from a loaded animation to commented out do the same thing? Yeah, probably. So um, what's being asked is, let's go back to this level to keep things simple. So if I just do this now, yeah. Because it, it doesn't know what to play. It just doesn't even have a thing. What draws me to puzzle games? I think puzzles are cool. How is the compile time compared to our last demonstration? Um, it's about the same. So since then, we had to switch to actually a slower linker, unfortunately, because the, there's this whole like tool chain problem with the latest versions of Visual Studio. It's just like, if you use the recent linker, it puts g horrible garbage dependencies into your executable and then you can't run it without like Windows 10 redistributable crap. Like Microsoft has no respect for anything. Anyway, so if I compile now, well, uh, the Visual Studio variables that I run now is um, I'm using the AMD 64 linker, which is a slightly different one like for Windows 8.1 or whatever. Um, and unfortunately, that one seems to be slower. So now when we compile, um, so our total compile time for the whole program is 0.6 seconds, um, of which, uh, well, I mean, that fluctuates a little bit, right? But eh, it's in that neighborhood. So 0.6 something, um, of which uh, 0.36 so more than half the time is waiting for the linker, right? So the amount of time the compiler takes now is uh, point, point 0.635 minus 0.363, no, it's uh, 636, 0.636 minus 0.363, so is 0.273 seconds. So uh, our, com our part of the compiler takes a little over a quarter of a second to compile this program. Um, now the program is bigger than what I demoed before um, because um, uh, it, so it's about the same size in terms of this report. It was like 52,000 at the reboot develop demo in Croatia or something. I forget the exact number, but several thousand lines of that code was actually commented out dummy code. Um, so the, the game itself, so those lines have since been deleted, but then thousands of lines of legit code have been added, right? So it's about 10% more code. Uh, and we compile, our part of the compiler is 0.273 seconds, which I believe is faster than was demoed before. And the language has more features. And I use more features because I'm using polymorphism more heavily and stuff. Um, so it's going pretty good, I have to say. Um, I just, you know, at some point we have to get rid of this linker dependency because um, it's really horrible. Is audio a bit low? Maybe. I think maybe the microphone is just far back because people were complaining about my mouse in previous streams. Um, it's turned up to 100% in OBS. So I'm moving the microphone closer to me, but now when I move the mouse, everybody will complain. Opinion on unit testing, TDD, BDD. Um, I think testing your software is very important, uh, but I don't think so-called test-driven design is a good idea. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, but tests are good. I don't believe in unit tests, really, but I believe in tests. So.
given the amount of work necessary to get hot loading to work correctly, could you talk about the thought process used to decide whether it pays off to implement and maintain such a system? Well, look, I mean, this took this whole thing, all the functionality I did was like three hours less than that because there were breaks and we started Q&A a while ago. Like we started at 9.48 p.m. and it's 12.38 a.m. So it's like two hours and change to do all of it. The amount of time that it took to make hot loading work I don't know, you could go back and watch the video, but it was certainly less than an hour of that. Um, so, like, how long, if it takes a minute for people to get back into, into where they were, then it only takes 60 animation changes before that time is paid off if there's only one person doing them, right? I mean, that's going to happen in a day. So, so if it took an hour, um, and if the time is one minute, then like le in less than a day, that time is already paid off, right? Um, if there's multiple animators or they work for more than one day, even if the time is less than a minute, it pays off very quickly, right? Um, if if anyone else ever uses this engine, which we're going to use, give out the source of the engine, then the benefit is multiplied massively, right? So uh, the answer to how quickly does this kind of work pay off is usually very quickly. Like if you think that was a lot of work, man, try. <laughs> <laughs> Try game programming sometime. Things are usually a lot more work than that. Um, you should make it print out that calculation so people can directly see how little time it takes to compile when they get to use it. Yeah, well, we do print it out right now. Like, all this gets printed out. So, like, front end time is 0.23. We don't print exactly total time minus linker, but it's pretty close. Like, total time is front end time plus this. Right, that comes out to the 0.27 that we came up with. But the goal is to eventually get rid of this linking time so that total time will be this number approximately with maybe a small amount of more overhead. So yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Do I plan on implementing some kind of BCD for when floating point would not meet certain requirements? I don't know about BCD. But like big nums maybe, like having a big num library is a no brainer, but the big nums would be like signed 64 bit integers. They wouldn't be BCD numbers. That's ridiculous. Cause you want them to be fast. You want them to be fast. Have I thought any more about using LLD? I mean, I've thought about it a little bit. Um, the thing is it, would, it might be a small amount of work to substitute LLD, but now that's a dependency that everyone who wants to use a compiler has to have installed, and that's annoying. Um, or we have to detect it or absence of it, and now there's a branching factor in what's going on. So then now if people are using the compiler and I have to work with them to narrow, nail down bugs, they could be using either linker, and it's like, eh, right? Whereas if I put in the work to just end run around the linker and we don't use it at all, then all that goes away. So what I would prefer to do is start looking at not using the linker uh, and see what happens with that. And if that starts to be a rat hole, maybe we do LLD as the near term solution or something. Or something. Why did I choose a Sokoban game? Uh, this is a very good, uh, this is going to be a really cool game, first of all. Uh, and secondly, um, because it's a sort of a top-down 3D view, it's less resource intensive than the witness style 3D view. So the engine doesn't have to be as hardcore, right? Because I'm building a new engine for this, I don't want to work for years and years on it um, before I can give it to people, right? And, and release the game. So we're picking, you know, a, an easier 3D rendering task that doesn't require as much work. And then the bonus of that is then the engine itself will be less complicated so people can understand it better when they go and use it. Is 
Is there a YouTube channel that shows the beginning? Yeah, I have a ton of streams on YouTube. Um, maybe I should put the link. If I ever put anything in this page on Twitch, I should put that kind of thing. Now, I'm working on a project where unit tests are mandatory. Could you go into more depth about why you do not believe in them? I should make a fact for this. Um, because, first of all, it's too much testing. Like, how much test code do you want to have to frickin' write? You know? Um, and I guess there's the question, like, you can do unit tests and write, okay. No matter what tests you write, you need to write the tests after you write the code. This whole thing about TDD, about writing the tests before you write the code, is nonsense because you don't exactly know what you're building yet if you're doing anything interesting. So you can't write the tests yet. Right? You might, if you don't know where to start, you could maybe write one or two little tests as like, oh, this tells me what API I need to call and stuff. But that API is going to change and all sorts of things are going to happen. So you, you need to let that change occur. Otherwise, you're encouraging your code to rot very early. Right? So, so write the tests first is complete nonsense propagated by programmers who don't have enough experience and or who aren't that good at what they do and or are slow and unproductive, right? Um, now, if you get into all this business of writing unit tests for every unit, I mean, it depends on what you mean by unit tests. If you're gonna try to diagnose every unit of your program and write a test for every unit, on the one hand, that's very thorough, which is good. Um, on the other hand, you're multiplying your amount of code tremendously, which increases the cost of your project. Right? So if you can test the thing not as a unit, for example, as an entire game, that might be a much more efficient way of testing in terms of uh, the number of hours you put into programming. Right? And maybe if a cryptic bug comes up in the middle of that, you could start writing individual unit tests to help you narrow down on the problem. But one of the things you find in complex systems like games is that bugs are not isolated to units usually. They, they happen in the more complicated parts of the code, which is where things come together and it's not really unitizable, right? So people who are really advocates of unit tests, I think in many cases are not, uh, are not that productive, first of all, but also are not doing systems that are particularly complicated in my opinion. Um, Now you could, so if you're NASA or somebody, you probably test the hell out of things, right? Um, and, and, but then software development is very expensive, right? So you look at some of these shops that say, oh, we do TDD and all that. And they're probably using horrible languages like JavaScript, which is why they need excessive testing in the first place. Um, but then, you know, you look at the average output of those places, like how much functionality per engineer year do they implement? And it's very low. So then you have to ask, well, why are they so zealous about their development practices if their, production, if their uh, output is very weak? And the answer is because most people are not self-critical and reality-based. <laughs> so, uh, you know, whatever. I'm sure people are going to be angry at me when this shows up on YouTube, but... Um, that's what I think about all that. The other thing about tests is a lot of people advocate, well, you should compile all your tests and make sure they pass, like every time you compile your program. And that just slows down the compile edit debug cycle, right? Which makes you less productive as well. So all these things. That said, right, don't, please don't take me out of context. Testing is very important, right? If you don't test your software, then your software doesn't work. Um, what I'm saying is I don't think that this obsessive unit testing that happens in many cases is the right way to test. I think there are more efficient, better ways to test that capture more bugs. And you want to do those things. Does it regularly seem helpful to talk through programs yourself even when not streaming? No, not really. <laughs> Um, I mean, sometimes I do like think of what the hypotheses are for the bug, but I don't really verbalize it and, um, yeah, you know. Uh, 
The second half of your question. What was the second half of your question? Since one million lens per second is your goal, and that's probably over half an order of magnitude away, are there straightforward ways to do that you just haven't worried about yet? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I haven't gotten picky about the data structures in the compiler. Like the syntax tree is using a lot of memory that it doesn't need to. Um, that might help. That's not going to get 5x, but it might help some. And the other thing is most of the compiler is not threaded yet. Um, the thing that takes the most time is the type checking phase. And that's also the hardest thing to thread, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be threaded for the initial release. I would guess probably not. Um, but that said, there are redundant computations that are happening in type checking that can be sped up. So um, I don't think for the initial release of the compiler that we're going to hit a million lines per second. Um, but I hope that we'll be faster than we are now by, well, certainly without this link time, but hopefully we'll be faster than this 0.273, uh, right? I mean, what is this? So uh, 55612 divided by 0.273. So that's 200,000 lines of code per second. Um, I would hope that by the initial release of the compiler that we get up to three or 400,000 lines per second, roughly, um, which is pretty good, you know? And then uh, I think, then we start getting into the land of, of serious, but ultimately tractable optimization that'll get us up to a million. I don't think a million is unreasonable. I don't think two million is unreasonable. Um, especially if we can parallelize the type checking, then we will mostly scale with your n number of cores, uh, which would be very exciting, right? Um, I mean, this, this number right now is a little bit of a cheat because it assumes that we can replace that link time with zero, a zero time operation, which is not true, right? Um, hopefully it'll be close to epsilon, but it won't be zero. So maybe, maybe our current real number is under 203, right? But it's not that much under 203. I'm not going to talk about design right now, especially because I'm real tired. Someone says they think unit tests are great until fighting them to refactor stuff. This fighting can happen at most phases of development. Right. Well, that's one of the problems is like the more code you have, the less agile you are. And unit tests add a great deal of code. And so changing things, it's like tar, right? It's keeping you stuck and keeping you from changing things. When I feel stumped about a problem, what tricks do I employ to unstump myself? I go do something else for a while and then I just usually, usually something relaxing like a physical activity and then the idea to unstump me usually shows up. Have I ever written my own C++ subset guide? No, I'm just, I'm just not that interested these days in doing that. I mean, basically, you know, what people call C with classes is what I do. I use a very small amount of templates, like two in the entire, uh, in my part of the code for the witness, there's probably two templates. Um, and I only use single inheritance that's very shallow. Am I going to release updates to the game engine as I work it on the future? Maybe. We'll see. We'll see how it works out. How much memory is the Sokoban game taking? I don't know. Let's find out. I mean, we don't have that many graphical assets and stuff, so... Uh, 
Sokoban is uh, 100 megabytes. So Ultra Search is using more than twice as much memory. Microsoft VS Hub Server HTTP Host.exe is using more memory than this game that's drawing this very nice scene with this animated character. Anti-malware service executable. Creative Cloud 32-bit is using almost as much memory. God, software is so horrible right now. I mean, we actually have to load all these high-res bitmaps and stuff, like uh, people. You're looking at how to represent currency for financial calculations. You came across BCD. Wasn't sure the current state of the art. Yeah, I don't know if there's a reason people use BCD for that. It might be, you know, currency, like if you're doing banking applications, those are very serious applications, right? And so there will be a lot of pressure to use well-tested existing code. And that code might like date back to Fortran or something where BCD was common. I don't know, I'm talking out my butt. I never programmed in Fortran or COBOL or anything, right? So it could be that those libraries were ported over from those languages or might still be in those languages and you link to them and that's why they're in BCD, right? Or it could be just that the algorithms were originally designed in BCD and um, because you wanted them to work on non-twos complement machines and so forth, right? Uh, and that they're just established and you can use it. It's easier to use them than to make a new thing and know it's completely bug free. For, for, for banking, you really want to be conservative. That's my guess. I don't actually know. But, but if you want a general like arbitrary length number package, BCD is a slow way to do it. Right? You want to use numbers that at your, are at your machine's word size. Is there still one other person working on the compiler? Yes, there is. Yeah, that's a good, pseudonym 73 brings up a good point, which is that good programmers throw a lot of code away. Completely true. <laughs> uh, TDD developers would also have to throw the corresponding unit tests away. Also true, right? And then write new tests for the new thing. It's like they, t they eat a large constant factor on the volume of code that you have to write where in, in many cases, I've heard of shops that write 10 times as much test code as actual code. And these shops aren't like NASA. Like their, their, end, their end output of code isn't even that robust compared to what you would like, but they write 10 times as much in the way of tests. That's like a massive drain on productivity. It's horrible, right? It's like pair programming. Like whoever decided back in the extreme programming days or whatever like oh pair programming is a good idea everybody should pair program and it's like okay wait you just right away because two people are sitting there writing code and one the, the keyboard is shared between them you've divided their productivity at least by two and possibly more right because they're talking a lot and arguing and whatnot right so somehow the claim has to be that pair programming gives you efficiency gains of greater than two and probably much greater than two, right? And nobody ever tested that numerically. They were just like, oh, pair programming is a great idea. So um, yeah, this is the kind of people who tell you how to program, right? Like just nobody, nobody cares. They get these ideas and they, they're not, empirically based ideas, right? So, yeah, the whole, all these books telling you how to program do the same kind of thing where they say, do thing X because it has benefits Y and Z, but they don't tell, tell you about drawbacks A, B, and C, right? It's a cost benefit analysis. Everything has benefits, everything has costs. You have to pay attention to the costs and take them seriously. 
the reason why programming has not advanced very much over the past many decades, despite the fact that all these new paradigms keep getting proposed, is that people don't pay attention to the costs because the costs are subtle, right? The benefits are obvious because the thing got proposed because of its benefits, and you'll hear about the benefits. The costs tend to be subtle and or swept under the rug by the people who want to sell you on the benefits. Uh, and so people don't see the costs and then they invest heavily in these paradigms of doing things and then 10 years later they're like, oh, we're only 3% better at developing software and we were supposed to be 50% better. What happens? Well, what happened was you didn't take costs seriously. So, yeah. That needs to be in the facts somewhere. I noticed you used some for loop macros in C++. Could you show us how they're implemented? No, I mean, I don't really, I don't really like that macro. I just use it out of inertia now. I, I don't like it. How many hours can I code in a day before getting too exhausted? Um, it depends. Like eight hours is pretty easy. Um, and that's eight hours of actual programming at a regular speed. If I'm like redlining, like programming really fast, eight hours is hard, but doable. Um, I've done 14 hours a day before for weeks at a time um, when I'm really motivated. And, and those are 14 hours of not goofing off, like programming fast. So that comes out to like, uh, what, 98, is that right? 98 hours a week for all seven days? Yeah, you know, so I've worked on rare occasions. I've programmed for up to 100 hours a week, uh, but I don't do that very often. And it's only when I'm really happy about uh, what I'm doing and really motivated to crank on it. Um, and after I do that, if I do like a 90 plus hour week like that, or even an 80 plus hour week, um, that's not sustainable in the long term. Like my brain is tired and needs to rest. Um, so then the next week is very light or something like that. Uh, I haven't done that. And if I haven't done, I would say that I have not done a more than a, I might've done like a 60 hour week when we shipped Mac OS witness, but that was not particularly hard programming. Um, 80 hours a week, I probably haven't done in three or four years. 90 hours a week, yeah, probably I haven't done since 2013 uh, when I worked on a side project game that n n none of you guys have seen yet that will be released someday because it's a cool game. Economics book is off topic. Uh, the meditation related thing I want to do soon. It's just I've been working on programming tasks and I need to just plan out what that talk is going to be. So it'll it'll happen. I would say within a month, hopefully within a couple weeks, but I need to like really figure it out. Yeah, I said 98 hours a week. Who, who came up with 200? Would I consider doing a pure game design stream sometime? Um, maybe. The thing is, I don't want to spoil games too hard. For this game, I probably won't do a pure game design stream. Maybe if we do an expansion pack for it. This is the kind of game that could have an expansion pack. So once the main game is out, that might be a fun thing to do, is just design the expansion pack and work through it.
But that would be way later. Like we're talking not this year, possibly not next year. Like that would be in the future. How do you solve timing problems? For example, do X, wait three seconds, do Y, then do Z. I've seen visual languages solve them well. Coroutines seem reasonable, but much more error prone. Um, that kind of a thing in games usually, uh, usually is a behavior on something in the world, like an entity, like this guy. It's not quite a timing problem. Oh, I broke the walk animation. Let's unbreak that. You know, like there's there's a timing thing about like when to play the footstep sounds or you know when to stop walking and I mean all that's oh oh that bug's still in here so the the music decoder eventually barfs. Even though the music is not audible, we're decoding it every frame. And I'm doing something wrong decoding the AUG or something. So I need to look into that. It's a bug that only fires on rare occasions. Now, this, this bug has been in for like months. And uh, yeah, I just haven't fixed it because it doesn't happen that often. Um, what was I saying? I forget what I was saying. I how tired I am. I don't know anything about blockchain technology. What was I saying? Someone remind me what I was saying. Oh, timing problems, coroutines. I mean, I just don't... Coroutines in game engines are usually for, like, simple scripts on objects. But the problem is when you program that way, then your objects are not going to react emergently to stimuli because your coroutine is on a very linear path. So I don't actually think it's a very good way to program for games um, because it's very brittle. Like coroutines are about, the, the nice thing about them is they look very simple because it's like, I'm not thinking about anything else. I just want to go. But in a game, you want to think about other things. You know, you want to interrupt and divert and modify and interact with other stuff. And so, I mean, I think you kind of want that code to be in the frame somewhere. And I think that's even true outside of games, but people don't do it enough. Any idea on when you get to the private beta phase? There's a couple of big features I want to do, uh, and then we'll be in private beta. Well, a couple big features, um, and then a, a serious debugging time, and then we'll be in private beta. I would say it's almost guaranteed that private beta happens in 2017. Um, I mean, I won't completely guarantee that, but it seems very likely that private beta will happen before the end of the year. But who knows, I might get slow, I might work on the game more, it might take a few months more, we'll see. Yeah, private beta for the language, not the game. Um, there is no sign up for the private beta. The very initial private beta will just be a small group of friends for some number of weeks until we verify that it's not completely busted and then we'll branch out to more people after that. And I don't know, I, I don't know how to, I'm going to solicit people who want to try it because I do want relatively serious people. So I have to figure out how we're going to make that happen. The criteria is going to be just people who are going to seriously try it out and play with it. Um, preferably who have at least a little bit of programming experience because, you know, I don't want to teach people how to program. Uh, but aside from that, you know, I don't mind. All right, now I'm gonna go. Thanks everyone for coming by.
I think I'm going to stream some more later on uh, as I keep working on this animation system. This has been good progress for today. The next step, the next step is going to be now, um, well, the next step is going to be making these states less hard coded. And that might start by keeping them in code and not in a data file yet, but like constructing them with functions that build a data structure. Um, so that might be the next step. And then after that, we'll make a file that lets you specify and modify those. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Uh, Joshua all, all, already uh, has it running on Linux, supposedly. Although, you know, compatibility in Linux is probably always a thing. Um, fuzzing would be great. Like if somebody wanted to write uh, a fuzzer and or just, like we don't even have a thing that automatedly runs tests right now. <laughs> like I have all these old demos that I run as tests once in a while. But, you know, we do want to do the thing where run them and compare the output versus what it should be and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the alternate thing of a fuzzer where it's like run the compiler and see if it crashes or if it doesn't crash. Check the output to see if it says internal compiler error like that would be super useful. Super useful. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.